This week on Jerusalem Dateline, crisis in Kurdistan. The Iraqi army and Iranian-backed Shiite militias take over key territory from the Kurdish army and put the region on edge. It's an astonishing coup in a certain sense. We're not quite sure where this will end. Plus, Christian media from around the world come to Jerusalem. This is really historic thing that we started it and we wanted to become a tradition. And a Holocaust survivor celebrates 100 years and counting. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. The latest conflict in the Middle East involves two U.S. allies pitted against each other, the Kurdish regional government and the Iraqi government in Baghdad. The Kurds voted for independence, but Baghdad, Iran, and Turkey all oppose Kurdish freedom. Recently, Iraqi forces, along with Shiite militias backed by Iran, drove the Kurds out of the oil-rich province of Kirkuk. Reports say the two sides have agreed to a ceasefire, but the events of the past week represent a major blow to the Kurdish regional government, a setback for U.S. interests in the region, and a boost for Iran's goal to dominate the Middle East. After the fall of Kirkuk, thousands of Kurds demonstrated outside the U.S. consulate in Erbil. They protested the lack of U.S. response to the Iraqi army and Shiite militia's military campaign against the Kurdish government. It's an astonishing coup in a certain sense uh, by the Iraqi government, supported by the Iranians, a very major blow to the Kurds. Uh, we're not quite sure where this will end, but certainly right now the Kurds are in uh, retreat. Middle East analyst Jonathan Spire explained Iran is the power behind the military campaign of the past several days. The Iranian role was very prominent and uh, openly declared. That is to say, the leader of the Quds Force of the Revolutionary Guards Corps, General Qasem Soleimani, was in Kirkuk in the days preceding the uh, military, Iraqi and Iranian military move. Before the offensive, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told CBN News, Iran's goal is to build a Shiite Muslim arc of power in the Middle East. What they want, you know, from, from Tehran to Tartus, you know, from Iran to the Mediterranean, they want this Shiite arc to colonize it and control it. And, uh, uh, and everyone's concerned. Look at this, they're trying to import Shiite militias that are now trying to choke the Kurds in Kirkuk. Because of the close partnership with Iraqi forces and Shiite militias, those militias used U.S. weapons for the offensive against Kirkuk. And we saw a situation in which the Shia militias were operating the state-of-the-art Abrams tanks, the best tank, US-made tanks in the world, uh, against Kurdish forces who had nothing like the same level of anti-tank capacity. I think from the point of view of the US taxpayer, I wonder how the US taxpayer would feel to know that you know, his or her hard-earned uh, dollars have basically gone towards equipping a uh, fervently anti-Western Shia Islamist militia force. The Kurds proved the U.S.'s best ally in the war against ISIS. During the recent referendum for Kurdish independence, retired U.S. General Jay Garner told CBN News how the Kurds can be a vital U.S. ally against Iranian expansion. Strategically, this is one of the best locations in this part of the Middle East for us to have an ally and we could have a strong U.S. ally. That's why the Iranians are against us. They don't want a strong U.S. ally on their border, which is what the, Kur the Kurds are. It would be like a carrier, a carrier stationed in this part of the Middle East, a U.S. carrier. One of the few countries to stand with the Kurds has been Israel. CBN News has learned Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been calling world leaders to stand with the Kurds. And Israel's intelligence minister said the Kurds must be protected from extermination. Some experts believe how the U.S., the world's only superpower, responds in the next few days and weeks may well determine the future of the Kurdish people. Even with the ceasefire, the Kurds are fighting not only a military battle for survival, but facing diplomatic and economic isolation. They lost 50 percent of their oil revenues when Kirkuk fell, and Iraq and Turkey are discussing an oil pipeline that would bypass Kurdistan and further isolate the Kurds. One of the few countries to stand with the Kurds has been Israel. CBN News learned Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is calling world leaders to stand with the Kurds. And Israel's intelligence minister said the Kurds must be protected from extermination. Some experts believe how the U.S., the world's superpower, responds 
in the next few days and weeks may well determine in part the future of the Kurdish people and the Middle East. To understand more about the situation, here's more of our interview with Middle East expert Jonathan Spire. We have a map here, uh, Jonathan, uh, that, that shows a couple of things. First of all, this line can, now this line right here uh, is the outline, I believe, of the Kurdish regional government uh, from 2003. Yep, that's right. right. And, and what's this uh, area right here? So these areas uh, south, so to speak, of the line in purple are the areas which the Kurds moved into in the course of the war against ISIS. ISIS obviously moved in to, uh, to Iraq from Syria, eastwards from Syria, in the summer of 2014, that very dramatic mm -hmm. summer. And in the course of the Kurdish military response to that, so to speak, the Kurds moved into and conquered over the subsequent two or three years a large amount of territory. And that's what's represented here in purple south, so to speak, of the line here. Okay, so this land, if I understand it correctly, was in dispute. Yeah. The Kurds claimed it, mm. but the, so did the Iraqi government. Yes, that's correct. But what has happened with this border right now? So effectively what's taking place, and, this, and it's not yet complete, but the process taking place is that the Iraqi government, in effect, is rolling up all these areas, is pushing the Kurds back. Uh, to the 2003 lines. We talked about Kirkuk earlier on. Kirkuk has gone. Much of this area further to the west has gone also. The Iraqi army and the Shia militias are effectively rolling back the Kurds to the uh, 2003 uh, line. Now, have they gone beyond the 2003 Yeah, they line? already have, actually. In the, uh, in the west, they're already a little bit beyond the uh, 2003 lines. They're into Sinjar, and they're pushing further. And there, there are serious questions about the forces uh, engaged. Many of my uh, contacts in Iraq and in Iraqi Kurdistan have been saying, OK, we get the fact that the Iraqi army probably just want to push us back to the 2003 lines. But what's the agenda of the militias who are supported by Iran? Does the Iraqi government actually control these militias or are they controlled directly from Tehran? Maybe the militias, therefore, with their momentum moving forward, will simply want to carry on moving forward, in which case the potential for you know, very serious military clashes, even inside the pre-2003 Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, is very real. So their agenda might be just to continue taking over yeah. Iraqi Kurdistan? Until someone stops them. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. It's possible. We don't quite right. know. And then the militias and the Iranians like to keep us uh, guessing, of course, until things become very clear at a moment of their choosing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to find out. Now, is Erbil the capital of Kurdistan? Is that in danger? Well, here's the thing. The, uh, the Iraqis have been pushing uh, northwest uh, from Kirkuk city, and they're currently located about halfway between Kirkuk and uh, it'll build. There was a town called Al Tun Kubri, which fell over the weekend. That's the point, and they're now the Iraqis are now a couple of kilometers north of Al Tun Kubri, and that's the furthest uh, north they've gone so far. Um, right now, the Iraqis are still inside Kirkuk province, the border between Kirkuk and mm -hmm. Erbil province, but halfway between the two cities. Um, if the push forward continues, uh, the Iraqis are currently around 40 kilometers from south of south uh, east of Erbil. If the push forward continues, then you know no one should rule out the possibility of uh, a move towards Erbil itself. Right now, though, it's not possible to predict that. And I would have thought that from the Iraqi government's point of view, especially given its very good relations with the United States, which have been demonstrated in recent uh, days, it would probably be a mistake to push towards their bill. That would, of course, be against the Americans' wishes. The Americans don't want to see the KRG destroyed militarily. So probably not, but it, one shouldn't rule out the possibility of a push towards their bill. Like I said, they're around 40 kilometers mm -hmm, from there now. Mm -hmm. What can the U.S. or the West do to help support the Iraqi Kurds right now? Well, a great deal could be done, but the general sense is that the, uh, the United States is not currently in the mood to support the uh, Iraqi Kurds. Uh, I think there was clearly a great deal of, of annoyance with regard to the Kurds choosing to go ahead with the referendum. As it turns out now, the Americans have chosen to get very firmly behind the government in Baghdad. Uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson was in Riyadh yesterday alongside Prime Minister Abadi for the inaugural meeting of a new thing called the Saudi-Iraqi Cooperation Council. The sense is the Americans are looking in a different direction entirely, not towards backing their staunch allies in Iraqi Kurdistan, but rather trying to offset Iranian influence in Iraq itself by pushing or pulling the Baghdad government closer to the Saudis. That's what I think they're going, they, they think they're going to do. I personally don't think it's going to work. But sadly, from my point of view at least, the notion of increased American support for the Iraqi Kurds right now, I'm afraid it's just not on the agenda. That's not where the thinking seems mm. to be. Coming up, the Trump administration takes a bold stand for persecuted Christians in the Middle East.
Christianity, as it's been known in the Middle East for years, is doomed if the Trump administration doesn't step up to the plate to help persecuted Christians. That's what former Congressman Frank Wolf told CBN News in a recent interview, and he said time is running out. If the Trump administration is bold and does some really bold things, I am hopeful. If they don't and the church in the West is silent, then I think we will see the end of Christianity in what is really the cradle of Christendom. Abraham is from Ur. I was in Nasiriyah and they said this is Abraham's village. And Ezekiel's buried there, Daniel's buried there. The Trump administration seems to be taking up the challenge to help persecuted Christians in the Middle East. Vice President Mike Pence say he and President Trump are working tirelessly to protect ancient Christian communities. In a keynote address to the annual summit of In Defense of Democracies, Pence said help is on the way. Under the leadership of President Donald Trump, I can assure you, the United States of America will always stand with those who suffer for their faith and we will always support them in their hour of need. Because I'm a believer. And I believe that he who said that when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. That he who said, I will never leave you or forsake you, never will. While Christians are being persecuted in most of the Middle East, the Jewish state recently reached out to Christians. In what some are calling a turning point in Israeli-Christian relations, the Israeli government invited Christian journalists to Jerusalem and rolled out the red carpet. The Christian journalists were honored by Israel's prime minister, president, and political leaders. Israel has no better friends, I mean that, no better friends in the world than the Christian communities around the world. As we say in Hebrew, kol hakavod, all the respect. God bless all of you. They came for the first ever Christian media summit, sponsored by the Israeli government. The representative in this uh, uh, Christian media summit represent over one billion Christian Zionists. And they pray for us, they join us, they support the state of Israel, no matter politics, right, left, wing, doesn't matter. They support the state of Israel with all the heart. Israeli government minister Zippy Hotavelli and Naftali Bennett said how important it is that Christians take action. This is really a historic thing that we started it and we want it to become a tradition. Understanding that Israel is, is on the right side of things, that we're fighting for freedom, fighting for values, and we need your support. We need the Christians around the world to back Israel, to be out there and never be silent. 130 media executives and journalists came from 40 countries and joined the event. It was important for us to see many people coming together and getting the plans uh, uh, that God has for Israel and for our Christian nations to be together with Israel. Participants said it was a great opportunity to connect with Israel. I think it's, it's just opened up so many avenues for um, more information, more information flows both ways. Um, and it's an important story, it's the most important story. This is a real sign that the Israeli government recognised the contribution, particularly made by Christian broadcasters around the world in defending Israel and the Jewish people. It's especially important in these days of so-called fake news for Christian media to tell the truth about what's actually happening. Many suggested the conference was such a success that they should have it again next year in honor of the 70th anniversary of the Jewish state. CBN CEO Gordon Robertson was invited to address the Christian Media Summit and shared about CBN's production, In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. He challenged the journalists to tell Israel's story to the world. The Israeli government invited CBN CEO to talk at its Christian Media Summit about the docudrama, In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. It was all shot Ammunition Hill on location in Jerusalem uh, with Israeli actors. We went above and beyond to make sure it was absolutely accurate. CBN produced the film in honor of the 50th anniversary of the Six Day War and the reunification of Jerusalem. It tells the true story behind the battle for the city through the eyes of the paratroopers who fought it. Robertson said last December's UN resolution declaring Israel's possession of Eastern Jerusalem illegal underlined the importance of getting the story out. As a Christian in this room, we need to understand what that really means. That means 
that Visible. some of our holiest sites would be turned over to the Palestinian Authority. As a Christian, I say, no way. Israel has made a huge difference, and that's the story of the 67 war. Robertson told CBN News it's critical for Christian journalists to tell Israel's story. I think it's the most important story of our generation. We've literally seen prophecy fulfilled uh, in my lifetime. Can Jerusalem once again be the capital of Israel? Well, that got answered in 1967. Writer and director Aaron Zimmerman talked about the need for journalists to know history. Most people will report on the current facts of the Middle East, on Iran, on Syria, on what's going on. A lot of people don't delve into the history, and I think really you need to understand the history in order to get what's going on today. Robertson's advice to his audience? I tell Christian journalists, remember Psalm 126. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Uh, that needs to be our watchword. Let's tell the world the great things the Lord has done for Israel. Coming up, see the Roman treasure that surprised archaeologists digging under the Western Wall. Welcome back. A surprise discovery in Jerusalem leads to an underground section of the Western Wall hidden for nearly 2,000 years. While digging, archaeologists also found a surprise from Roman times. This is known as Wilson's Arch. Archaeologists began digging under this covered area to determine its age. Where we're standing right now, we're standing underneath Wilson's Arch, um, underneath the indoor, indoor men's section of the Western Wall Plaza. The excavation started about two years ago. We drilled down these beams to support the floor because one of the main goals of the excavation was to not interrupt with the prayer activity going on. Wilson's Arch is one of the only intact visible structures remaining from the Second Temple period. It was part of a bridge that served as a passage for people to enter the Temple Mount. Although its existence wasn't a surprise, the site of huge stones buried for 1,700 years is still a scene to behold. We knew it was here, but to see it is, um, is very exciting. This is the Western Wall. This is the exact same thing as you see upstairs and outside. The preservation here is a lot better because it's been covered for the past. No rain, no sun. Um, the preservation here of the stones is probably the best of the, web, the stones in the Western Wall to, that we know of today. Still, once under the street, Archaeologists came upon a surprise. The most in interesting thing that we found over here is a building, a semi-circular building or theater-like building. Dr. Avi Solomon said it's the first time in 50 years here that a public Roman building like this has been found. Therefore, the importance of the excavation is enormous. And it also confirmed historic documentation of a theater near the Temple Mount. This shows us the change of the culture of the city from a Jewish city um, focusing on Temple Mount. Jerusalem changed into a Roman colony um, that has different needs and different uses. Um, one of them is building entertainment, uh, leisure buildings as this uh, theater-like structure. And there's more. Underneath uh, where the floor originally was, we exposed a drainage channel that is built out of stone. And Lieberman adds, this could ultimately lead to an interesting destination. It might even connect to that, to the same drainage channel we know in Robinson's Arch and in City of David. And if that's true, you could probably walk from underneath the Western Wall Plaza, Prayer Plaza of today, the modern uh, Western Wall Plaza, all the way to Pool of Solon. Archaeologists hope to open the site for sightseeing in a few years. Coming up, a Holocaust survivor of nine Nazi camps inspires many as he turns 100. As time takes us further from the Holocaust, there are fewer survivors. But here's the story of Elias Feinzelberg's journey and his 100th birthday. It's an example of what you can find on our social media platforms. Me llamo Elias Feinzelberg. 
Nací en Polonia, nací en se llama Lodz, 22 de octubre de 1917. Estas son las mañanitas que cantaba el rey David. La hermosa día de tu santa te las cantamos a ti. Me salvé. Dios me ayudó, Dios me ayuda y, y pide siempre este. Cinco hermanas y dos hermanos. Los nazis los, los mataron ni toda la familia y me quedé solo. Sí. El dominicano me libraron el día el mes de mayo de 1945. Estoy más contento que una vez hice algo en mi vida, que he estado con mi familia a Israel, que me gusta mucho Israel, aquí cada piedra es mío. What an inspiring story. Well, that's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. <music>